Ephesians chapter number one. Um, we're, we're still in, in, in chapter one, verses uh, four and five. So let's look at that. In verse three, uh, we'll read four and five and then have a word of prayer. Ephesians 1, 4, speaking of the all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, verse 3. Verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the word of truth, rightly divided. We give you thanks and praise for the Lord Jesus Christ, his work on the cross uh, of Calvary on our behalf, uh, to give us his righteousness in exchange for our uh, sinfulness. You made him sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him when we trust him. We thank you for the faith of Jesus Christ, his work on our behalf. We can just trust him and walk by faith as believers. And if we're faithful to our death or the rapture, we can be joint heirs with him. We found faithful. Thank you for that blessed hope, and we look forward to it in his return. In the name of our, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Amen. All right, look with me at verse number four. Last time we saw according as he hath chosen us. So we spent two weeks dealing with chosen in him. There's a lot of confusion about what's, what it means to be chosen. We now have on video and audio. If you want to share that with someone, they're confused about what it means to be chosen. Uh, we have that available. But notice in verse 4, according as he hath chosen us. Now, don't forget those last two words, because I've heard Calvinists, that theology Calvin, I've, I've heard them in the past, some famous Calvinistic preachers read this verse, and they always seem to leave out those two words in him, in him right? Yeah. So the, the chosen is not the individual, it's the one who has placed their faith and trust in Christ. That's Then you're in the body, okay? Now, we saw last time that it was before the foundation of the world. We saw that God had this plan and purpose that he had before the foundation of the world. I had one more verse I didn't go, uh, go to. I, uh, every once in a while, I'll, I'll leave that, that Colossians verse last or one of the Thessalonians verses that sums up something, but I don't have time. Hold your hand here. Look at one more. Go to that um, sister epistle or, you know, that um, spousal. spousal epistle. That's right. I was, that's right. I, I changed that up. Uh, we saw how Ephesians shows the body of Christ, the church, which is his body, right? Ephesians 5, Paul talks about the church as uh, uh, wife, wives are just like the church, and the husband is like Christ the head. So look at, look at Colossians, that issue of uh, foundation of the world. Go with me to Colossians chapter number 1. And uh, this was the last verse that I wanted to get to, but I didn't have time. Notice in verse number, we're going to be back in Colossians a lot in this study of Ephesians, by the way, so maybe you want to keep a, a marker there. Look, up, look at verse number 26, Colossians 1.26. Even the mystery which hath been hid, what, from what? From ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. So we're going to be back in this passage later, but notice Remember, we were saw, saw before the foundation of the world or since the world began, God had this hid in himself. He calls it the mystery. The, 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 the way that Paul defines his preaching of Jesus Christ is according to the revelation of the what? Mystery, Romans 16, 25. That's why we have mystery here as opposed to prophecy. If, uh, Acts chapter 3, 19 through 21, Peter, he talks about Jesus Christ, that which was made known out of the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. Okay, uh, Revelation says that Jesus Christ is the, the spirit of prophecy is Christ. Okay, In the prophetic program, Christ is according to prophecy. But when you rightly divide God's word, there's some preaching of Jesus Christ that God did not make known, a sacred secret called the mystery. Notice what he calls it here, verse 26. Even the mystery which hath been hid. So remember, God had it all along. It's been hid in God, we found in Ephesians. He didn't just make it up in Acts 9. That's when he began to reveal it, Titus 1, in due times, plural, these visions and revelations of the Lord, 2 Corinthians 12. But God had it already in mind. It has just been hid, verse 26, from ages and from generations. So all these cycles of, of humanity are in, in time. God's dealing with humanity. God kept it hid, okay? Now, notice it says now, verse 26, but now, that's very key in Paul's epistles, is made manifest to his what? Saints. By the way, 
When you try to explain the rightly divided word to a lost person, in fact, one of, the, one of the reasons why people don't see this and don't get it is, quite frankly, they're lost. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, 2 Corinthians 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. You have some people who don't believe, and they're religious and legalistic and have a power, have the uh, form of godliness, but deny the power, the cross. And what you're dealing with, the reason why they can't see this stuff is they're lost. Notice whom God reveals it to, verse 26. But now is made manifest to his saints. See? To whom? His saints. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the what? Glory. What's associated with this message? Glory. If you don't get this message, it's, it's that hope of glory. And not just any glory. All saints will have some glory. The glory of God's grace we'll see in Ephesians but there's a higher, he's ordained it before the world unto our glory, 2 Corinthians 2, 7. He wants you to have be that joint heir to reign with him. There's the glory he's talking about. God, notice he didn't just say glory. Verse 27, make known what is the what? Riches of his glory. See? So it's, it's a higher level of glory. Among the Gentiles. Of this mystery. Of this what? Mystery among the Gentiles. Right which is Christ in you. And, and, and what he means in you, you Gentiles. God, God always made it known, or at least from, from the time of, of, of Abraham, that Israel, that the Hebrews would have a Messiah and that through him and, his, and the Hebrew seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. But never did God make known what he's going to do through the fall of Israel. All that's the rise of Israel, not the fall. But through the fall of Israel, Romans 11, 11, salvation is coming to us Gentiles. Ephesians focuses on the Gentiles and how God has given us a word called the mystery of Christ. And notice what it says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, again, it's that glory, that blessed glory of not just the inheritance and heir, but that joint inheritance, a joint heir, reigning with him. Because look at the rest of that verse, 28, whom we preach. So we preach Christ, but notice how you, you preach him. What's that next word? Warning every man. Now the men there have to do with those in the body. Now watch this. Made known to his saints. What are you warning people about? The judgment seat of Christ is coming. Don't and it matters. Sure, sure. Don't have your rewards. Boy. Exactly. And, and by the way, Ryan just said it. The next chapter of Colossians, he goes into how not to be spoiled of your reward. The reward of the inheritance. By the way, look at verse 28. Whom we preach, warning every man... But just don't warn them. We want to teach them right. We want to teach them what the truth is. And teaching every man in all wisdom. Now watch this. You remember I said, I, I, I get this question about sonship, and that's, a, that's, that's probably second to judgment seat. Because the judgment seat being preached will make people walk, will motivate folks to walk in their sonship, the curriculum. Because notice this, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. What is he talking about? Maturity. Maturity, that's right. But where would, where would Paul, where would we present, where would Paul and his ministers present that? When will that be made manifest your maturity? At the judgment seat of Christ. It's all there. Verse 29. Whereunto, if I had to tell you what was Paul's motivating factor, it was the love of Christ, but he understood the terror of the Lord to persuade man, 2 Corinthians 5. Look what he says. Verse 29. Whereunto I also labor. There's that labor of love. Strive in according to his working, working, which worketh in me mightily. You know what Paul did? Paul did the work of faith himself, and he allowed God to work through him. There's the labor of love. And that word of God kept Paul going on as the satanic policy of evil was being formed in that day. Satan only got, could know what he knew after Christ revealed it to Paul. But the point is, as Paul gets the revelation of the mystery, Satan, he starts to formulate an attack to hinder the gospel of grace. Now he has 2,000 years where he can do it. The, the whole course of this world is set up to, if you do the work of faith, labor of love, if you do the work of faith, labor of love, the policy of evil is ready to, to withstand it. We just have to put on that whole armor of God. So go back with me, if you will, to uh, Ephesians 1. So that was just from last week, all right? Okay. 1 Thessalonians 4, 6 is another good verse. The, the yeah. avenger of all such as... Well, we also have forewarned yes. you. Forewarned, yes. Yeah. 
and when I, when I told that brother, I said, here's sonship, but here's the judgment seat of Christ. I could teach a, a message on it. When I said it, Paul, at least 125 times, there's a guy who wrote a book about the judgment seat, and he came with that. I, 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 he had just listed them all. I think it's more. I can find every time I read a passage, I can see it. Brother Ryan just mentioned 1 Thessalonians 4, where he says, the Lord is the avenger of all such, how you treat one another, as we have forewarned you and testified. You know what he's talking about? When would the Lord avenge? Uh, 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 I better say it like this. When would the Lord avenge when it comes to the members of the body, other members of the body? The judgment seat. Now, he's going to take vengeance on them that know not God in the, in the, in the future, in the day of the Lord. But Paul, in, in first, uh, first Thessalonians 4, is talking about here. In fact, Notice where it's at. First Thessalonians four. He's the, talking about the, the Avenger. Yeah. The word there is like penalizer. The penalizer, right? The only other time it's used outside of that verse is in the Old Testament, the Avenger of Blood. And why would you defraud your, your brothers and, and sisters in Christ because you're not operating? That's the way. That's right. The truth. I'm telling you, man, this thing is so important. And in these last days of grace, by the grace and mercy of Almighty God, it is our job, our privilege, to put this out there. Sonship is great, but let me tell you, judgment seat of Christ will affect that. <laughs> That's a greater thing. Because if I'm telling you about the judgment seat of Christ, you know what you're going to be serious about? The curriculum. Mm -hmm. The work of faith, labor, love, pain. You're going to walk as sons and daughters sonship because of the judgment seat of Christ. There's the motivating factor, see? All right, let's keep going. Um, and I only bring that up because I get a lot of questions recently about it. And I want to keep, keep everybody knowing that that's fantastic. But there's something greater, the judgment seat, which is the goal of the sonship. You want to study to show thyself approved unto God, and that's where it's going to be. All right, let's keep going. Verse 4, Ephesians 1. So, according as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, so we saw all of that, that what? Here's the purpose. Why did God do this? That we should be what? Holy and without blame before him in love. What does it mean to be holy? Well, holy, holiness is talked about a lot in Scripture. Holiness means to be set apart from the world unto God. Okay? So you can see, let me show you a verse. Go to 1 Thessalonians 1. Let me show you a beautiful verse that shows that. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 9. So first says God more. Well, what it is, is holiness means to turn away from the world and turn to God. And here, here's what Paul is saying. This is a, this is a one of the, the holy, holy means set apart unto God, but to turn away from one thing to another, to be set apart unto God. Notice chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 9. For we, excuse me, for they themselves, Paul writes, show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. And how, now watch what the Thessalonians did when Paul brought the gospel of grace. It purified their hearts. Watch this. And how he turned to God from what? Idols. Acts 17, 29. They turned to God from idols. Who were the Thessalonians serving? Where well, they were serving idols. Idol worshiping heathen Gentiles. What did God do? When the gospel of grace came, Paul taught them how to be holy, to turn to God from idols. To serve the who? Living and true God. Okay? There's your salvation, sanctification, all that in verse uh, 9. Then you got verse 10, and to wait. That's Romans 8. The, we, we wait. We, we wait for that, for that resurrection, for the glory. When you, when you serve them, and they were serving the Lord. By the way, when these people served God, they were Pauline grace believers, the Thessalonians. That's what he means. He's not just talking about anything in general. They were walking in their sonship here. They were, they were joint heirs at this time. Because guess what they were doing? Suffering. The two books, well, 2 Thess Corinthians as well, but 1 and 2 Thessalonians, they were suffering for being Pauline grace believers like you and me. Here we go. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the what? Wrath right. to come. So we're going to be out of here before that. They were being confused by people that they were going to go through the, the tribulation and all that. All right? Right. Our, our resurrection is pre-tribulation, pre-wrath. All right. Go back to first, uh, Ephesians 1. So that issue of holy. Oh, Romans 12. What did Paul say? 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies, what? Living, Living sacrifices, holy, holy acceptable. acceptable unto God, which is your what? Reasonable service. Okay? He, he doesn't want you to go and strap a bomb and blow yourself up to, to, for paradise and to for the, for the, for blow up the infidel. That would be a dead sacrifice. He, that would be a dead one. That's right. God wants you to live, but live holy unto him as a living sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. Every one of us could, should look in our lives at where we is your time, your treasure, talents. That's it. Those three areas you could say, am I doing what I need to do to get the work of faith, build up the doctrine of the grace of God and rightly divide the word in me? And how am I laboring with the Father to do that for others? And only you and God can come up with that. Now, if you ask me or some other brothers where you think you could be used, if you kind of, but you, it's between you and God. You know yourself. Where can you do what you're doing? And what you guys are doing right now is being a part of this ministry. That's part of the, the, the work there. Ron, okay. if he made a list of things for us to do, we would do it out of duty instead of out of love. Right. Uh, he doesn't need to put a list out because we're adults. Yeah. I write out stuff for Jada Lynn. When she gets to become a teenager, I say, here's what mom and dad want you to do. Boom, 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 boom. But once she gets an adult, she says, I know the mind of my parents. I know what they want me to do. She just does that. She does. We should know the mind of our Father, the mind of Christ. By the Word. By the Word of God, particularly through Paul. As you learn this doctrine, that's why we teach verse by verse, you start to read, oh, be not trans uh, be not, he says, living sacrifice, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the what? Renewing. Renewing, constantly knewing of your mind. Yeah. And, and it's perpetually. That's, that's the word, Ryan, exactly. That comes from study. That's the work of faith right there. That's what you're doing right now. So that, that's holiness. But tonight, I also want to look at, go back to Ephesians 1, 4. This is without blame. Because sometimes I've had people ask me, say, what is this without blame, Brother Ron? Does it mean sinless? Well, you know it doesn't. But can I tell you something? There are people, crazy people, ignorant people who think, that once they get saved, that they no longer sin. That's just nonsense. Because Romans 7, Paul says, I know that in me that it is in this flesh well, it's no good thing. Go with me to Romans 7. Let me show you something about this body that you have right now. By the way, he calls it a vile body, Philippians 3. Who shall change our vile body. You know what vile, vile is, right? Disgusting. Evil. Yeah, it's, okay. Here, go with me to Romans 7. Let me show you what the Apostle Paul says about 30 years into his salvation. If Paul was saved around 80, 31, he wrote the book of Romans, you know, late 50s, maybe early 60s. So he had been saved for about 30 years, okay? Let me show you what he says about his flesh. Romans what? Romans 7. 7. Where are you going <laughs> Oh, yeah. It's something about these bodies. So you, let me show you what, what you can do. Sin doesn't have dominion as you continue to grow in the word, but be, as long as you have these vile bodies, there is sin in these members, okay? W watch what he says here. Um, verse number 14. For we know that the law is spiritual. So this, he's talking about the law of Moses that he was, he was under when he was uh, lost as Saul. It's spiritual. That's God's word. The words I speak unto you, they're spirit. But I am carnal, sold under sin. I get that. Paul wasn't saying he's carnal like the Corinthians, living in sin. We're going to see later, he lived a life that wasn't debauchery, okay? Even as a lost man Pharisee. But what he's talking about, he's talking about in his carnal flesh. Watch this, verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. So he does some things he doesn't want to do. For what I would, the good things he wants to do, that do I not. Sometimes you want to do right, you just can't. But what I hate... Now, what I hate, that I do, that, I do. that do I, right? Yeah. Think about that. I hate arguing with my, my wife. It happens sometimes, okay? That's why I was saying the dispensations. Even husbands and wives don't agree 100% of the time. And Chris and I have the same soul, as it were, compatibility, chemistry. We think alike, and we just male, female. But she's a female, I'm a male, something. Sometimes, and we got flesh. Sometimes you just don't want to do it. You just don't want to. Be right. You, I mean, you want to be right. You just don't want to do right. Notice here it says, that which I hate, verse 15, that do I. Now look at verse 16. If then I do that which I would not. Paul says, my will is not to do that. 
but I do it anyway. I consent to the law that it is good. The law is doing its part to, to, to condemn me. Now then, this is verse 17, what I want you to see. Now then, it is no more I that do it. Who does Paul see as his real self? His inner man. His spirit. His spirit. Yeah. Yeah. It is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwelleth where? In, in me. me. And just so you don't think he's talking about his inner man, watch what he's verse 18. For I know that in me, the def definition, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find it. So forth. So he does recognize that in these vile bodies, there's still sin. Fallible. You're fallible. So when, when we look at this issue of blameless, it's not sinlessness, okay? You ought to sin less. As you continue on growing in God's grace throughout the years, you should sin less. But you're not going to be sinless until you get your out of this vile body, wretched body, wretched man. Yippee. Amen. Say it. We heard that. <laughs> and we get our glorified body, no sin, okay? Amen. But it doesn't mean you just continue in sin and grace may abound. No. You, you walk in the, in the spirit. Okay, so there is sin there. So what is blameless? If blameless is not sinless, what is it? Well, blameless, let me show you what it was under the law. We're going to look at it under the law and under grace. Go with me, if you will, to uh, Philippians chapter 3. Let me, and you get Philippians 3 and Luke 1. Philippians 3 and Luke 1. I'm going to show you something that most believers aren't, aren't, doesn't understand. That when Saul of Tarsus calls himself the chief of sinners, he's not saying he sinned more than anyone else. First Corinthians, uh, excuse me, First Timothy 1.15. Paul says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And most people who don't study the Bible or haven't studied it out think, well, Paul must have been the, the greatest sinner. Now, he did commit sin, the uh, persecution of the saints, of the Jewish saints, the little flock. He had people murder and so forth. That was bad. But when you look at his life as that religious Pharisee under the law that he was, the young man Saul, for that 30 years, that man, you look at his life, and he was the holy, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, separated of the separated. He's blameless by the law. Well, that's what we're about to see. That's, that's right. Look at uh, Philippians 3. Now, now watch this. So it be, he's given his pedigree back in the day, verse number uh, four. So if you want to, if you want to be religious, he says, look at me, verse four, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. By the way, what's the flesh? This is religious flesh. Flesh is flesh, whether it's carnal flesh or religious flesh, legalism, it's all flesh to God. Verse, verse four, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Paul didn't like to boast, but he's trying to tell you, you think you're religious? No, 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 you ain't seen religion. Look at me 30 years ago. That's what he's talking about. Watch this. In fact, go, go before 30 years ago, because by the time he writes Philippians, he had been in the ministry over 30 years. Go back 60 years. The man is in the 60. Go back to his birth. Notice what he says, verse 5. Circumcise the what? Eighth day. What does that? What does that imply? Abrahamic covenant, right? Circumcise those boys on that eighth day. By the way, that's one of those things that you're talking to Jim about the the things that the Jews knew about uh, reality before anybody else did. Okay. That's, the, that's the first day where blood clotting. Boom. Yeah. Thank you. We're talking about those things. How did you? How did they know that? And the Gentiles were called the uns. They didn't know these things. In fact, not just circumcised, but on the eighth. Day. There's there's that reason with the blood clot. Yeah, that's fantastic. The is at its greatest. That's the beginning, right? The eighth day. Well, well, it, it's it's symbolic of a lot of things. Circumcised the eighth day. There's there's that thousand year millennial, seven thousand year, and then uh, we go into yeah, after yeah. the seat, but uh, after the great white throne. But just just practically in in the human in the in the human uh, <coughs> body that that eighth day was the perfect day to do this thing. Yeah. yeah. Because because. Blood blood clotting. He's talking about the blood, blood clotting. That's when blood clotting starts in humans. Yeah, yeah, that's when it's it, when it, okay. on the edge of the vitamin K is at its isn't that isn't that isn't that true? And God knew that. Yeah. Well, I mean, God knew, but God knew not God. <laughs> he taught he taught the Hebrew people. Yeah, he taught them that. Well, look at the, look at the rest of that. So circumcised. And by the way, 
it, it's also, let's look, look, circumcision, what that, what that represented was a cutting off of the flesh. Literally, what Abraham could produce in his flesh, where the seed come out. My, my daughter said the other day, <laughs> I got to share this. I can't talk about, I, my, my, I can't say anything about my, my genetics. So she's looking at my belly. She, she looks at her belly. She's skinny, but she got a belly. You know, just running my father's line. His father, all my uncles on his side, we all shape the life, no matter what we do. So, Jada Lynn, she was pushing on my belly. She says, you got a baby in there? I said, no. <laughs> she, go, she goes, mommy said I was in her belly, but I want to be in your belly. <laughs> your belly's bigger than her. I said, well, you, you're not in there anymore. Your mother got a flat belly now. Mine, that's just, that's just me. <laughs> and I did her, that's just you, you know. But she, it, she says the craziest thing. She's just growing. But she's talking about our belly. The circumcised, it's what, oh, yeah, she goes, she goes, yeah, she asked me, she says, well, how did I get? She says, how did I get in mommy's belly? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. So I go, and I was just kind of doing something for you. I go, well, daddy put you in. You know, I, that thing on my head. I go, daddy put you in there. Well, how'd you put me in there? I go, oh. go ahead, I said, go ask me. <laughs> I'm going to sit down. There's the seed. There's the egg. Well, hey. What does Hebrews says about Abraham? Le Le Levi paid tithes in Abraham. He's talking about a man that was in Abraham, you know, Isaac and Jacob, Jacob's son, Levi. The DNA. The DNA. Yeah. How, it's the same way that we were all in Adam, right? When he's saying. So I had to tell my daughter the truth. I said, Dad, put you in there. How did you do that? Go ask mom. Go ask mom. I just changed the subject. One good thing about four year olds, you, they, their attention span is real small, so you could change the subject. Here's a doll, you know. But anyway. I, it made me think about it because the circumcision of that foreskin of his flesh, Abraham and those men and then the children, is cutting off what those Hebrew boys, Hebrews men can produce on their own, right? God has to do it for them. It's, it's comparison to Colossians 2 where we're circumcised. God has circumcised, spiritually circumcised our flesh, this flesh, from the rest of us. It was connected before when we were lost. Now the flesh is, there was a circumcision that took place of our flesh from our inner man. I'll explain that later, okay? So what does the eighth day represent? A new beginning. The number eight represents new beginning, right? What's the cycle? One Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven, and God starts over, right? The eighth day, a new beginning. 6,000 years of human history, that 7,000-year millennium, the, the, the first installment, and then after the great white throne, the new beginning. Okay, so there's this eight. Eight is a new beginning. Uh, when he had Abraham circumcised, there was a new beginning in the plan and purpose of God in the earth through Abraham the Hebrew. All right, <clears throat> verse five. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. By the way, was was uh, what was Abraham's son's name? Abraham had Isaac and who? Ishmael. 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 Was Ishmael, pop quiz, was Ishmael circumcised? Yes. Yes, he was. Sure he was. Of course he was. Abraham loved Ishmael, his firstborn. He wasn't the promise. He's still a Jew. No, he wasn't a Jew. He was, he was, a, he was a Hebrew. He was a Hebrew because he come from Abraham, but he was a mix. Let's say it like this. He was half Hebrew, he was half family. Egyptian. Jew is the religion. Right, Jew is the religion. The Jews come later. We'll talk about that. Good question. We'll bring that up in the Q&A. Here, they're not Jews yet. They're Hebrews. Abram the Hebrew, Genesis 14, 19. Well, he was Syrian, actually, right? Well, yeah, but that's, he, he's from Ur to Chaldees, Syrian. But he was called Abram. The first time that word Hebrews used, Genesis 14, he's called Abram the Hebrew. That's where the Hebrew tribes began, right there. We would say in Iraq. That was from Iraq. He's the first Hebrew, essentially. Yeah, he was the first one. That's how his... When he separated from Ur the Chaldees and his father's house, the Hebrews is what he was called. His tribe, his people were called the Hebrews. He was first, he's essentially the first Hebrew. Who was the first Jew? Is well, that, that comes later. Yeah. Jacob? Well, no, it's, it's really when, when the law of Moses. Yes. The, the religion is the Jew. Mm -hmm. And then they were known as Jewry or Jew, the Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have, let me get into it in the Q and A, okay? So I don't. But just remind me the Jews, because because it's, it's you got to kind of work through this Israeli thing. Israeli and Israelites, the nationality. That's right. So when he says of the stock of Israel, remember Abraham had Ishmael. He was circumcised. So you just can't go by circumcision. 
And Abraham circumcised all his men. And, 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 and I have no doubt that uh, Ishmael did too, because Ishmael was blessed by God. Don't everybody forget that, but God made him princes. He told Hagar, I'm going to bless him too for Abraham's sake. So don't forget that. But Isaac is the promised seed. Now, Isaac has two sons. Who are they? Anybody remember? Jacob, Jacob and Esau. Esau. Brothers, twin brothers. Wasn't Esau circumcised? You bet. Yeah. Yeah. You bet he was. He, and when he was eight days old, he had his two young boys there. Isaac did, uh, Isaac did and said, Jacob. Twins. Yeah, twins. twins and Esau. And I'm sure Esau, well, I'm not sure, but Esau could have very well done that with his sons. The point is, you got to remember, you have to be of the right stock. So the stock, the promised stock is not Jacob, excuse me, not, not Ishmael, but Israel, and Jacob who became Israel. Now of that, he narrows it down to the tribe of Benjamin. Remember who Benjamin was? Benjamin was that youngest child of Jacob and Rachel. They had two boys, Joseph and Benjamin. Remember that, the whole thing? And Benjamin, he says, she called him Benoni, Genesis 35, and she son dies. Of my, son, son of my grief or my pain. Grief, right. That's what she called him because she's dying. She died. And the daddy called him Benjamin, son of my right hand. There you go. Or my strength. So there's some, the, the first, I mean, the Benjamin is that is that favorite tribe there. At least, it's how I say like this. Yeah, it's a favorite tribe. It, think about the first king of Israel as far as in that land there. It was Saul. He was a what? Benjamin, right? right? So they have some status. In fact, I have no doubt that Saul of Tarsus, Paul, was named after they the were, first king of the were, Okay. Uh, during the wars, they were skilled with the with the bow yeah. and, and and the sling. Yeah. They were they were they were the they and, were the Cadillacs of their army. And you have to remember that these kings the, in that day, rights. the kings would would in, would usually be like generals, or you know, they'd be warriors. David was a warrior. Uh, many of the kings of Israel, as far as when, when if they took power, they were coup d'etat or whatever, when, when, the, the way it worked in that in that in that time period is a lot of kings of the, these different nations were like warriors, Alexander the Great and so forth. They go out and battle. In fact, it said about David the whole thing with Bathsheba when the kings go out to battle. Right? Remember that over there in and it was a first king. Whatever, I'm trying to remember, is either Samuel or 1 King. But the fact is, what David got in trouble was for, he should have been out there with his troops. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, all the mighty men of David who fought for him and with him were his cabinet when he took the, <coughs> when he took the throne. I got a sneaky suspicion when Paul, I keep reading these talks about Warreth. The faithful in the body of Christ who are on the front lines fighting the attack with the gospel of grace. Just like David, he put his mighty men of war who fought, for, who, who risked their lives for him. He put them in the highest places of his kingdom. Same with us out here. Those of us who fight the good fight of faith with and for the Lord, we're going to be part of his cabinet there in the, in the highest heavens there. Okay, there's some parallels there that I've, I've seen. We'll talk more about that. Go with me again to uh, Philippians 3.5. So he was of the stock of, of Israel, of tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews. There, there's that word Hebrew. So he was pure. He, was, he could go in his genealogy, which you know he did, go all the way back to Abraham on both sides of the family, right on through. That wasn't even true for even the Lord himself. You look at the Lord's genealogy. There's, there's, there's all type. There's, there's mixes in there. Ra, Ra, was it Rahab? No. Ruth. Ruth. Remember Ruth, the, Mo, the Moabites? Ruth married Boaz, who, and they had a son named, was it Jesse? Yes, yeah, it was Jesse, and then Jesse had David. David. And so even in the Lord Jesus Christ line, he had, he had Gentiles in there, okay? And, and remind me about Rahab. Was Rahab? Rahab was a Gentile. Yeah, she was Rahab. Was she in that thing? Yeah. I think so, but at least yeah. we know Ruth. I got to go check it out. My point is, you can look at Saul. He went back to Abraham, both parents. Uh -huh. Pure, Hebrew of the Hebrews. Keep going. As touching the law, oh man. He was a great lawyer. There he was, Pharisee. Was law, Pharisee. You know what Pharisees mean? The separated. Yeah. They were the cream of the crop when it comes to the law. They believed in the rest That's why of Jesus was so leaned so heavy on Nicodemus. Hey, well, exactly. He said, You call yourself you a teacher and you don't know this. He goes like this, you're a ruler in Israel and you don't, you don't know, know this. this. John 3. <laughs> My point is, Saul of Tarsus was a 
Pharisee, by the way, in Acts he says a son of a Pharisee. His family was Pharisee, his dad. Verse number six, you want to see how much I can concern the zeal? Verse six, concerning zeal, you want to see what my fire and my zest for, for religion? Persecuting the church. Now, what church is that? Little that's, little that's right. That's that little flock. Messianic. That messianic church that existed in the book of Acts before Paul was saved. <laughs> you see that in Acts 8 and 9. We, we've been over there. 7, 8, and 9. All right. Now, here's what I want you to see. Touching the righteousness which is where? In the law. In the law. In that performance-based acceptance system <laughs> called the law of Moses before the dispensation of grace. How does he describe himself as what? Blameless. Blameless. The works but not the faith, right? That's right. The what? The works but not the faith. Yeah. And obviously we get to the point where, exactly, he did the works. In other words, let me show you. That's why I want you to see this. And Ryan just brought it up. Let's look at our next passage in Luke 1. Here it is right here. Go to Luke chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 1. <laughs> Ryan just brought it up. When you looked at Saul's life, basically, when you say he's blameless, he did all the ordinances. He did all the religious ordinances that Moses said to do. But his these people approach me with their with their feet, but their heart are far from me. Isaiah says they, they didn't have the heart of faith. In fact, the reason the Lord Jesus Christ had to come after fifteen hundred years under that law is to show that they need it. The law was a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. Right. He, need, he came to show them that they could not keep that law right. the way God says to do it. Their heart was far from them, okay? Saul was one of them. Show, let me show you something. Go to Luke chapter 1, verse 5. This is uh, John the Baptist's parents. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So John's parents, both of Aaronic stock. Okay, here we go. Aaron is uh, Moses' brother, Levi. Here we go, verse 6. And they were both righteous before God. So both the man and his wife, righteous before God. Now, does it say they're righteous before God? Yes. Got to get this right, because people confuse this, because yes. they read grace back there. God looks at them, they're righteous. He said, hey, Zacharias, you're righteous. Elizabeth, you're righteous. Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, how? Blameless. Blameless. That's how they were righteous. That's how they were righteous. They were under the law. They were walking. They had the, a heart of faith. God looked at their heart of faith. By the way, faith doesn't always mean no works, just in our dispensation. Right. Because, by the way, after you're saved, let me show you something. There are works involved Life with your faith. Life you walk by faith by doing certain works as members of the body. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto what type of works? Good works, right? Ephesians 2.10. We'll get to that. But, so, so, Dorothy, these are people under the law. They're right here. They live right here. Okay? John's about 30 there, so let's go back 30 years. They're about right here. His parents... Uh, are about to, his father's about to have Gabriel tell him that he's going to go home and uh, be with his wife, and they're going to conceive this son, his son, who's the greatest prophet that ever lived before he, man, because he's the forerunner of Messiah. Okay, here we go. They were righteous under this law. The difference between them and Paul, though, what we're going to see, who comes along 30 years later, because Saul was about the same age as John and the Lord Jesus Christ in that vicinity, yeah. okay? They had faith. He was just going through the motions. And obeyed the ordinance. Right. Do you think that... Go ahead. Do you think that when it came time to accept the Messiah, like when John the Baptist came out and said, hey, mm -hmm. it's time, do you think that's when Paul was no longer yes. righteous? When the gospel... Fantastic question. Ryan's question was, when did, when did Paul and any of those guys mm -hmm. stop being no longer righteous in the eyes of God? When the law that was the schoolmaster bringing them to Christ, once the preaching of the Messiah came and they rejected that, that's when they ceased to be righteous. That's the, 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 the Jews who had faith like, uh, oh, the one, I read the book of John. That's the first book of the Bible I read before I was saved. I was six months in that church before I said, 
I read about a man named Nathaniel. I, I see myself like the, his, he, he, he appealed to me because he didn't have to see any miracle. All the Lord said was, before you, you, your, your brother Philip called you, I knew thee, right? I saw you under the fig tree. Right, right, right. And it's symbolic of the law, right? It's fig tree. And he says, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king. Like he had childlike faith. You're the Messiah. We got to see that. I want to show you that on the way back. Go with me to John chapter 1. Is it 1? Yeah, John chapter 1. I want you to see what a childlike faith in the truth of God's word. Nathaniel, he, he was the most, he one of the most soft-hearted guys I've ever seen. And I, lo I love that. Look at me, uh, look with me at, at uh, John chapter 1. And uh, let's see here, is it John 1? Yeah, here we go. Verse 43. I, if, if you want to read a passage where you see what God likes in a, in a man's heart, what the Lord in the book of Luke calls a good and honest heart, a soft heart to believe and not a stony heart. I was talking to a sister in the Lord today. She's, she's dealing with some folk about the truth and they reject it. And I said, they don't want to, they got stony hearts of unbelief. I go, no, she says, she's frustrated and, and discouraged because they keep rejecting. I said, it's not you, it's them. They don't want to believe. Here, watch this guy named Nathaniel, this, this, this man. He's a, he's a member of the little flock, a brother we will see one day. 45. Verse 43, just to get the context. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find it Philip and said unto him, follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, uh, Bethsaida, never said it, Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So Philip was in the, from the same place where, where Andrew and Peter were brothers. Uh, 45, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him. Now watch what he says. We have found him. Now if they found him, the Messiah, that means they were what? Looking for him. Yes. You got to get that. Saul wasn't looking for Messiah. The Jews who rejected Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry weren't looking for Messiah. Not the Messiah that the scripture pointed to. Watch what, and, watch what Philip says. Verse 45. We have found him of whom Moses. Moses in the law and the prophets did write. Now, I'm going to stop right there. How did they know to even look for the Messiah? <coughs> Moses told them, the prophets told them, the word of God to Israel told them, the Old Testament. Hey, if you were an Old Testament Jewish believer, you would have been looking for the Messiah. And that was being read in the temple. The All temple, the, the Sabbath on the synagogues on the Sabbath. Yeah. Not only that, Dorothy, I'm going to go so far as to say that it was read in the homes of the Jews. Right, it was. I'll compare it like this. Church is not the only, church is where we come together and expound and encourage, but fathers are supposed to be teaching their sons and daughters, their wives and at home. When I say teach. They're supposed to read the scriptures at home each day. Well, they did. They, they did. They wrote it on their... Uh, you know it. What, what, yeah. when Moses said in Deuteronomy, when you stand up and you sit down, like he'd go through, you're in the field, and th he was going through everything. Everything is the word, the word. Were they looking for him constantly, or did they... Well, sure they were. Sure they were. Sure they, sure were. Daniel and... they were looking for the Messiah... I could show you verses even before, but definitely since the law of Moses, Deuteronomy, Moses says in Deuteronomy 18, 15, he says, the Lord thy God shall send thee a prophet like unto me, him shall you hear. Jesus Christ, they're, they're, when they say, um, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they'd say, some say Jeremiah, right? Jeremiah is supposed to come. Others, Elijah, Elijah is supposed to come. And they would say, and then others say, that prophet. You ever see that? They're talking about that prophet spoken of by Moses. The, one of the two witnesses. There'd be John, uh, Elijah, and then Moses. There was, Go ahead. There was the faithful yeah. uh, uh, among the few oh, yeah. he, he, right after the first dispersion. Because when you start reading the book of Kings, mm -hmm. this king did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Oh, yeah. This king did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Well, we were saying... <laughs> At all time, a dear brother that back in uh, Michigan, Midwest, Brian Ross, he's, I'm still in the 20s, but he's all the way in the hundreds now. He's doing the silver line of truths from Paul all the way to our day. Even in uh, Brother Jordan to, to, to get, because he, he plays a part in that. There's always been a silver line of Pauline truth. That's right. But there's always been a silver line of truth, a, a small remnant, and, and, and every distance, and all the way through. 
Remember when the Lord Jesus was announced, or did the <laughs> announcement to, to Mary and Joseph? And remember they went to offer him, when I say offer, the, every firstborn that breaketh the matrix, breaketh the womb, must be offered, but you give it an offering, right? A turtle doves is what, because they were poor. And what happened? I think it was Simeon and then another woman, Anna, they... Anna, she was of the tribe of Asher. Yes, they see the baby the and they go, they go, Lord, we've been looking for this little guy. Thank you. Because I think he says, you promised me that I wouldn't die until I see right. the salvation oh. of Israel. The man held the baby. Right. Right. Oh, man, it's fantastic. People were looking for him when he was a baby, That's before right. he was a baby. That's right. So uh, the point is, notice, let's just finish here real quick. Verse 45, we have found him of whom Moses, verse 45, in the law and the prophets did right. And again, he tells her who it is. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. <laughs> Watch this. And Nathaniel said unto him, can there any good thing come out? If you knew what Nazareth was, what, what, the, what the Jews thought about Nazareth, the, the place of rejection. Interesting. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, you, you come and see. Verse 47, I love it. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming. Now imagine the Lord's watching him come toward him. He sees him coming and said unto him, I, every time I read it, I got to take a break. No, to have the Lord Jesus look at you and attest, can I tell y'all what it's going to be like? The only equivalent I can say is that the rapture, well, the rapture slash the judgment seat of Christ, they go together. Like when all this faithfulness now is going to pay off then when He looks right at you and say, "You've done well." Oh wow, man! But I can tell you something too. A glimpse of it is how we grace believers who appreciate this deal with one another. When we encourage one another and you say, people think I'm crazy, I'm starting to doubt myself because all this opposition, I go, no, 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 no. You believe the truth, rightly divided. You believe Pauline truth. You're not crazy, they are. And when we encourage one another, I say, Dorothy, I know you get opposition, or Ryan, you get opposition, but hey, I know this stuff, you're, you, we, we, we're learning together, you're, you're doing the right thing. But that's nothing coming from a brother. When, when the Lord Jesus looks at you and says, well done. Wow. Yeah. And can I tell you something? That's almost that. Look what he says, verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Amen. <laughs> Every, almost everybody he ran in that, in that nation was, was, had, had guile and deception. And he looks at the man. He's talking about the purity of this man's heart. This man's just looking for the Messiah. He don't want nothing else but just, where's Messiah? Let's get on with it. Now watch this. Now, Nathaniel, this makes me laugh. He didn't say, oh, poor little me here. He goes, how do you know me? <laughs> he goes, you're right. <laughs> Finally, somebody gets me. <laughs> Look at the answer. Nathaniel said, oh, well, Lord, no. But Nathaniel, you know yourself. You know if you have a soft heart towards the word. It manifests. Watch with Nathaniel. Every time I read verse 48, Nathaniel said unto him, whence knowest thou me? He said, how, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Wow. Now, now he was literally under a fig tree. He was under in, in, in that fig tree. That's under. a big picture. That's a huge picture. What that fig tree represents, that religious life of Israel. Okay? And symbolically, he's sitting there laboring under that law, and the Lord's watching him. He's seeing that man wanting to, oh, it's a lot of there. I can't get into it, but you're right. Now watch what he says. Jesus didn't do a miracle yet. Didn't do any, he didn't do anything but just read this man's heart. And, and you, one day, remember what Paul says, the spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now I know in the book of Romans, he was still, there was still supernatural, so he was talking about some words. But now it's through the doctrine. But what, 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 what the Lord did was bear witness to that man's spirit of who he really was. That man loved God and he believed God's word. And the Lord says, yes, you do. How much, I mean, to hear that, we're going to hear that up there if we stay faithful. Here we go. So I, I, before you were under, verse 48, before that Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. Verse 49, Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, Thou art, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. Did it take a lot of persuading this guy? <laughs> no, man. Dorothy, that's why I'm telling you. People either want to believe God's word or don't. It don't take a long process of stuff. No. You can have a soft heart. 
You just put your trust in the verses, the doctrine to, to Paul today. It don't take a lot. This man just heard him say some things, and it was like no other man, and he believed him. Same as the apostles, they did the same thing. They took up and followed him. Well, well yeah, I mean, I, and obviously the, the, the reason is, is there's some, some doctrinal reasons this is written in John. But, but think about Peter, right? But Peter did see a miracle. It, it, it's not in the one thing. Okay, so Peter, many of these guys were followers of John anyway. They were disciples of John the Baptist, who then pointed them to the Lord. Now watch this, watch this. The Lord sees Peter and Andrew. They've been out there fishing, but they hadn't caught anything. They're commercial fishermen who father was a commercial fisherman. They've been, these men are at least in their 30s, maybe even 40s, and they've been doing this their whole life with their father. And producing nothing. Well, that that very day they weren't, but they they used to they know what they're doing. They're professional. They're professional. They've been doing it. And here's a carpenter who just walks up and says, "Hey, I know you haven't get anything, but throw it on the on the other side." Here. Peter looks over there and says, "Okay, Lord." I mean, he had saw him. He had saw him at the thing. He throws him out over there. It says that they had gotten they brought in so much fish. That their nets began to break and the and the and the boats began to sink. Wasn't Jesus trying to say to them, in your own efforts, you can't get it, but I can do it? It's all in there, but I, you gotta get this though. Okay. He's a fisherman professional. He and his brother and his father all his The nets begin to break, and as they bring it in, it's it's so much fish that it began to weigh down the thing. You, Imagine that. I mean, this is like never happened before. They've never seen that many. Press down, shaking, running over. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what Peter said. You remember what Peter said? He says, "Go, Lord. I, I'm. I'm. I don't even. You don't have anything to do with me. I'm just a. Yeah. I forgot what he said. You can read it, but he was just like, I am a sin, sinful man. He was so overwhelmed by that miracle of that fit. That was his. Judge. He got overwhelmed of the blessing. He just said, "Stay away, Lord. I'm just a sinful man." Something about Peter. When the Lord wanted to wash his feet, Peter was the first to say, no, 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 don't wash my feet, Lord. Peter was very humble. He was aggressive. He was impulsive. He was courageous. But he was very humble. So don't look, you know, people, sometimes Peter gets a raw deal when he uh, denies the Lord. But why in the world would the Lord pick that man? Because he saw something in Peter that he didn't see in anybody else. He saw a man with a humble heart, yet with a strong. Peter, he was humble. Lord, don't do that. I'm so sinful. Hard. Don't wash me. Even though they're the little plot, when you consider each of those 11 men and later Matthias, mm -hmm. if you really understand their personality, personality is huge. Right? Make up what under all the body of Christ is. Exactly. Everybody can't be a foot. Exactly. Everybody can't exactly. be a nose. Exactly. Everybody can't be an ear. The thing I see about Peter was his humility. Lord, go away. I, I'm, I'm a sinful man. So he saw himself as a sinner. He says, don't wash me, Lord. You shouldn't be doing that. He says, I, I should, we should wash your feet. He said, no, I'm going to teach you this in the book of John. But then he saw Peter saying, the first one to stand up to defend the Lord, at least, you know, while the pressure went on, is, is Peter, right? Uh, he took out a sword and tried to cut a guy's head off with hundreds of men standing there. So don't short, sell Peter short. Yeah, he denied him, but he's human. He, he feared but he proved himself just throughout, and, and that's the reason God made it. Leonard said one more thing before uh, I forget. Simon Zelotus, Simon the Zealot, and then Matthew the tax collector, yeah. Levi. Yeah. You can't get two opposite. opposite dudes. And it'd be cool if the Lord sent them out two by two. Here's a man who was a, ze a, a zealot Hebrew Jew who hated Rome, Fought. He was the guy who was that patriot. He was that guy who was all into the, the politics of the day. Let's go. He, would, he was that close to being our, our, our seditionist, you know, just to, we're going we're gonna to get our, get our country back from these Roman Gentile heathens. And here you have Matthew, Levi over here. He's sitting at custom, taking taxes from his own Jewish people for Rome. You can't get any different than that. And guess what? The Lord took them both. Leroy right, Leonard. He took them from all uh, spectrums. Oh, man. And Pastor, before you leave that yes, passage, please. I had a little note here that Nathaniel means a gift of God, and it represents a type of Israel. Thank oh, yeah. Nathaniel represents the little flock of it. Yeah, there's so much that we can, we'd have to. 
really and just see the past. Verse really. 51, like you said, he represents the little flock. He says right there in verse 51, you're going to make it to the kingdom. Well, look at 50 and 51 as we... As we uh, he saw him start and he knew he would endure. Oh, yeah. Now, remember John... Futuristic. Futuristic. So, so a lot of things, even, even the scholars, they, they could see, okay, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, synoptic gospels, and then Mark is different. The reason Mark... Uh, excuse me, excuse me. John is different. Matthew, Mark are over here, and then here's John. The reason what they're seeing when they study this out is John had, is profoundly different than the rest in that... And, and they don't know this, but I'm telling you. All of John's writings are futuristic. J uh, John the Gospel, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, the Epistles, and then Revelation, our future. So like, what, what Ryan, we're, let's look at what Ryan's saying. He doesn't talk like this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There's none of this futuristic thing. It's you had better endure it to the end type of stuff. But in John, he's, he's God who calleth those things which be not as though they were. It's like he's saying futuristic thing. Watch verse 50. Jesus answered and said unto him, Nathaniel, because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? See, you need a faith. Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now, Ryan, say what it again. He, Where were that? What was he talking about? Thank you. Talking about the kingdom. The kingdom. The kingdom. Oh, yeah. yeah. New Jerusalem. Yeah, New Jerusalem. And what's going to happen, Dorothy? And by that time, here's a verse. The body of Christ is already doing it. And there's going to be this go, go back and forth between the heavens and the earth. It goes back to Jacob's letter. goes back to Jacob's letter, Genesis 13. <laughs> I said it in these. It's these. the same exact wording about the angels. Was it called? Pinuel? 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 What's it called? Peniel? Peniel? What's Peniel? What did we talk about that? Peniel? Peniel. Peniel. Yeah. In the Bible, it's P E N. E-U-L, Peniel. That's Genesis 32, I think. But you're right. Jacob's letter, he sees, he has this dream, and he sees the angels of God ascending and descending. Prophecy, it starts here on the earth, and then go back and forth. There's so much deep stuff in that passage. So much, man. You could, you, we, we, could, we could only, yeah, we'd have to do a Q&A and just to kind of exhaust it and record it. Yeah. Okay, so I just want you guys to see, we got about two minutes, so go back to... Uh, Go back to Ephesians. This is fun tonight. I, I, I don't mind doing it. And, and the folks who live, they, they love this. Let me tell you. They wish they could just be here in our Q&As and stuff, too. Go back to uh, Ephesians and look with me at... Uh, I tell you what. I tell them. I say, uh, worst come to worst, just, just move here. <laughs> move. Yeah. Hey, this world getting worse and worse. And if your family and friends back there don't like you, whatever, you got some saints here who love you. Be a part. You with us anyway in spirit. I know I missed you when I went up to work. I know you missed it. <laughs> I love. I thank God for those brethren meeting and watching the tape. But there's nothing like live preaching. It's yeah. just not. I've wa I've watched. I've been in Brother Jordan's studies, and I've watched his studies. I did both. Not only Bridge School of Bible, but some of his current, some of his past studies before I was part of his ministry 18 years ago. I'm telling you, there's a difference of sitting there watching it live. You can't it, interact. You know how much is I, I was telling Ryan just last week, a dear sister of the Lord, I, I just finally told her after talking to Matthew here last Sunday, we don't have the manpower right now, the time, the money, the, the, the timing is not right for us to do live internet broadcasting, right? Now, these are studies that Ryan, and now there's, he's, he's going to catch up too because of his computer issues, but he's putting on each week. So then we basically just waiting a week and he's watching the video on YouTube. But it's not the same. Something in him's like, you know, and I had another sister in the Lord today say, hey, can we do at least Skype or something? It, it, it's this urge to be right there live yes. with you guys. It's our it, it, Exactly. Now, the only other thing, so, so maybe we can do live stream or YouTube down the road or whatever, but there's nothing like that live fellowship. See, God made it. What does a body do? They, they interact. Mm -hmm. So now thank God for the blessing of technology. So if you're stranded, a grace believer, you can still get the doctor. But there's nothing like what we got. So we got we to end, end this study for today. Uh, even though we went looked at some other stuff, it was still good. So the holy without blame. All right, so let's stop here. I wanted you to see that you could be blameless or without blame under the law. We saw two examples. There was Paul, <coughs> Saul, excuse me, Saul, 
And Ryan was right. Once, once the, the Messiah, uh, the preaching of Messiah came, the law was a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. The law and the prophets were until John, since that time the kingdom of heaven is preached. So once the gospel of the kingdom was preached, every man, what? Presseth into it, Luke, right? That's what the Lord said. <clears throat> If you were righteous under that law and yet you lived in this day and you didn't press into the Messianic Kingdom Church, trust Jesus Christ as Messiah, the what, baptism of John and so forth, you were no longer righteous. You no longer had faith and therefore you no longer had the preserving faith exactly. that would uh, lead you to continue the faith. Exactly. You didn't go along with the progressive revelation of God's kingdom program. Okay. Now, the, what, what, what saved Saul and a number of those Jews in his day who rejected Christ in the beginning was the dispensation of grace. When God changed the program, Paul got a chance to believe, stop kicking against the pricks. He was convicted. Stop fighting the conviction, Saul, Lord says. He stopped fighting the conviction. He gets saved, not into the kingdom program, no longer in operation. Excuse me. No longer is the issue, but uh, no, no longer in operation. No, because once he was saved, the body of Christ... With one exception, the gospel of the kingdom continued to be preached until Acts 15. And those who heard about Jesus, his death, burial, resurrection, remission of sins, from that gospel of the kingdom, like Cornelius, Acts 10, went into the body of Christ. They got saved. But after the Jerusalem Council, Acts 15, Peter and those guys, the, the head of the Israel, said, no more preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Paul's gospel of grace is, is in. Okay? We got him. We'll pick up next week so we got to see what it means to be blameless under the law, walking in all the commandments and importance of the Lord, blameless with faith. Then, next week, we're going to see what it means to be holy and without blame under grace, okay? we got to end. Uh, if you're listening and you never had anyone uh, love you enough to ask you, if you were to die today, do you know for sure you're going to spend eternity? I love you. These saints love you. That's why we have this ministry. But more importantly, God loves you. Paul says, God spoke to Paul, the apostle to us Gentiles, Romans 5, verse 8, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross, paid for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. I was taught as a young minister from Brother Jordan years ago, you give a gospel every message. If it's a grace conference, if it's if whatever, don't assume, even though you're teaching grace believers, give a gospel. Somebody's going to hear this who never heard a clear gospel. So the Son of God, Jesus Christ, died on the cross to pay for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day. If you trust him alone, what he did at Calvary alone, his shed blood alone, God will save you this moment, give you eternal life as a present possession, all sins forgiven, and eternal inheritance in the heavenly places. He will give you opportunity to then be, get the reward of the inheritance, the joint heirship. That comes after salvation when you do the labor of, uh, work of faith, labor of love, have the patience of hope to endure, be faithful at his return or your death, then you get your full reward at the judgment seat. We'll help you with all that, okay? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and life in him. We thank you that we can come together this, this uh, night, this Wednesday night, to study your word. We thank you for one another. We think about our brothers and sisters in Christ who are home, both uh, uh, under the weather and, and those who are not with us here in, in our region, our area, but are with us in spirit as they listen to these things. May you bless them with a greater understanding and appreciation of your word as you have with us today. We do appreciate that, Father. We look forward to the time. Uh, of the Lord's return where we can all be together forever. But until then, thank you for the, the local ministry here that we can come and encourage one another and, and grow in your word. We thank you for these things in Christ's name. Amen.